this is a book uh, written by Swami Vivekananda uh, called My India, the India Eternal. It's a great book, um, excellent writing and uh, I wanted to read the contents so that because you know the, the contents of this book are not is not available uh, anywhere. So I'll just read uh, some of it, okay? The message of Swami Vivekananda. A Western admirer once described Swami Vivekananda as being young in years but eternal in wisdom. If you accept this ecstatic statement at its face value, it establishes the relevance of Swami Vivekananda's philosophy today. He had a brief life of less than 40 years. He passed away just as the present century was beginning. Two world wars have taken place since then and there has been astounding progress in science and technology. As a result, the world as a whole has changed, so has man in his outlook and style of living. India, the country which was the queen of his adoration in the words of Sister Nivedita, is now an independent country, just as he had predicted. The country would be free within the next 50 years in most unforeseen circumstances, and like the world, India today faces um, problems unknown in his time. Can it still be said that Swami Vivekananda is uh, relevant today? Man making his mission. Swami Vivekananda's relevance depends not on the nature of the problems we face, but on the spirit with which those problems have to be tackled. His stress was one man himself, for given the right kind of man, no problem need to be daunting man making is my mission he used to say indeed a country's future depends upon its people how good intelligent and capable they are any country can produce one or two great men but this is no guarantee that the country will be great that may prove the country's potential but unless the level of the average men and women in a given country is high that the country cannot be said to be great Swamiji used to say that one Buddha or Christ did not determine a country's fate. It was the common people who decided what the country's future would be like. According to him, the real power of the country lay with the masses. He described the neglect of the masses as a national sin. Most of her ills, he said, were due to this. The masses, a sleeping Leviathan, as he called them, possessed infinite power, but they were never given a chance to play their role in tackling national problems. The masses remained mute spectators while the destiny of the nation was being decided by a handful of the so-called intelligentsia, who knew nothing about the problems of common people and whose only claim to the authority they exercised was that they possessed university degrees or a family lineage. They, in fact, were more concerned about their own share in ruling the country, and if they grumbled, it was because they felt they did not enjoy the amount of power they deserved. What happened to the common people, their persecution by the upper caste, their ignorance, poverty, all these were of no concern to them. Yet, they claimed to speak for the whole nation. They were spineless people who owed no allegiance to the country or its people, who had no courage to stand up to those who insulted them or their country. In exasperation, Swami Vivekananda described them as mummies who had ceased to exist and yet continued to influence people as symbols of a glory they once possessed. 